Hi, Ross. Hey, Matt. How are you? I'm uh, not bad, uh, considering the, the weather situation here. Yeah, the weather situation uh, is interesting, but it's supposed to get better tomorrow. It's only supposed to be 90 or something. Yeah, so no. that's... and maybe they'll start. They haven't been running the, the metros normally because of the heat for some reason. They've decided that. Oh, really? Yeah, so they've decided that like making the cars go more slowly and be more crowded will be a good response to the heat. Oh, wow. Well, see, I actually I, I lucked out because I just bought uh, my first ever car two weeks ago. Really? So wh- as miserable as the heat wave has been, I've actually been able to experience the travel, for the most part, in an air-conditioned car. Sure, so. and contribute to the, the, the global warming that's making it so Well, but I, I got a Toyota. I figure that that's, you know, basically a wash, right? I mean, they're, you know... Sure, maybe. Japanese-made. Okay. So anyway, well, speaking of the heat, I was I was planning to um, I was planning to experience even more heat this summer by taking a trip to to Israel. Yes. And I ended up canceling it because of the uh, well because of the troubles. And so I, that seems like a good segue into starting a discussion of the current troubles. The troubles. Where? Well, I mean, I, should I not borrow? I guess I'm borrowing sort of an Irish designation, but um, it seems, I guess we could call it the Israeli. That's actually a good question. What do you think the um, this struggle will be called hey, by the history books? It's tough. You know, I mean, it, it, it lacks a good name because uh, sort of Israel-Lebanon war or something kind of suggests itself, but technically but, but they're not Lebanon's technically not fighting the Lebanon. Um, you know... It's, it's, it's hard to say. You know, war naming is, is difficult. I, I, I feel like we still haven't come up for, with, a, with an adequate name for the war in Iraq. I mean, people call it the war in Iraq, but, you know, that's not, it's not like, a, like a good name name. Right. No, I mean, and nobody called, you know, the American Revolution the war in America. Right. Or the Franco-Prussian War, the war in France. Right, I mean, right. It does... or, or that situation with France and Germany, right. and, you know, it's bad. No, it's, <laughs> I don't know. There should probably be, you know, I mean, maybe there could be like a U.N. committee on war naming. Well, there should be. And you started with the first, the Gulf War. Now they call it the first Gulf War. Right. But I don't think we really call this the second Gulf War, which is an extra wrinkle of confusion. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a problem. You know, I, I've tried to sort of call this Gulf War too, but the uh, sort of, you know, style guide masters at the American Prospect uh, don't like that. They insist on Iraq war. Yes. Well, well anyway, so, so the troubles, or whatever you want to call it, the Israeli-Hezbollah-Lebanon war seems at the moment to be going badly for Israel. Or at least it's reached a point where people who are usually pro-Israel, like uh, Ralph Peters in the New York Post or Brett Stevens in the Wall Street Journal, are writing pretty searing critiques of the Israeli war strategy. Right. I mean, there's been a, a sort of... Um, I mean, I mean it's, it, it's a bit hard to say. I mean, on the one hand, there was skepticism from, uh, you know, people who um, tend to be critical of Israel from, from the beginning. But then you started to see a kind of second wave of hawks, um, I guess upset that Israel wasn't... Um, throwing enough ground forces into the battle, was relying too mm-hmm. much on air power. Um, you know, which, I mean, on the one hand, is like a way of criticizing Israel, but, but on the other hand, um, you know, it seems like a way of trying to immunize Israel. Not, not, not immunize, but to counteract criticism that Israel has been killing too many people by suggesting that, no, 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 they're being, you know, insufficiently... Um, you know, hardcore about this. Um, I think you saw J- John Podhoritz's column, which, you know, was composed entirely of uh, rhetorical questions, but was all about how, you know, maybe the West was, was getting too soft and, you know. Well, see, I, I, I think you were a little bit uh, a little bit hard on him for that column. I mean, I, I actually bought into his defense, which, it, it, in the sense, P- Podhoritz was, as you say, making the point that there are some wars that you can't win without being incredibly harsh. Mm-hmm. But... And, and, and you took it to mean that this is a way of moving the goalposts, of saying, well, of course we wouldn't be able to massacre one million people, but that makes it okay to massacre a thousand people. And maybe that's what he was trying to do. But I also, I do think there was a valid point buried in there. And I know you've gone back and forth about the question of whether brutality really wins in counterinsurgencies and so on. Sure. But, but, but it is true that clearly there are tactics that are out of bounds for Western powers in these struggles right. um, that, that would be available to other powers and that 
And, you know, there's, there's the point that, of course, we can't use these tactics because we're not, you know, Bashar Assad or whoever. We can't kill, we can't just go ahead and massacre tens of thousands of people, not only because we can't do it in the short run, but because we're not trying to run that kind of state. Uh, we're not trying to be totalitarians or autocrats and so on. And that's true, but I think that was part of Pedoritz's point, which is just that, you know, if you look at the sweep of history, usually, not usually, but often to win wars, people do really horrendous things. Right. And our form of sort of civilized warfare is a relatively new thing in the world. Well, I mean, we wouldn't, shouldn't be surprised. It's a, it's a to uh, uh, older models. No, I mean, I, I, I think that's true. I mean, I think, frankly, you just overestimate um, Jeff John Pedoritz if you think he was trying to make a, a, a nuanced uh, point about this. I mean, you, you read his writings over the, the long view, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I um, am eager to I jump to the worst possible construal of, of what he I means. suppose, but you should keep in mind that Pedoritz has actually been the voice of relative... Uh, certainly from your point of view, sanity on the Israeli Hezbollah question. I mean, he's been the guy on National Review's The Corner who is criticizing the, the sort of, I guess, the neocon fantasists, you might say, the people like Michael Ledeen who think that the lesson of the Israel Hezbollah conflict is that the U.S. needs to immediately attack Syria in an alliance with Israel. Yes, I mean, and, I mean, and Pedoritz has become. I mean, I, I, I agree with you in general about about Pedoritz's commentary, and that, but, but I, I have been surprised in a way that you know he's emerged as sort of a voice of moderation on this question, and maybe it just tells you something about where, you know, Michael Ledeen is. Yeah, although you know, I mean, Michael Ledeen hasn't been uh, t totally alone in that. I mean, there've been, I think, two two weeks in a row, you know, very curious. Um, Editorials uh, c coming from from the New Republic that start off talking about Israel and you know of course b because it's the New Republic uh, being you know very very gung ho but then kind of like right. in the middle we'll just sort of say that the United States one like asked rhetorically will the West get ruthlessly serious about Iran. Um, right. uh, another one, it, it also said something about seriousness and, and ruthlessness, and then had like a parenthesis where it says, well, bombing isn't our only option, but where the, the, the whole thrust of it seemed to be that, you know, it, the fact that Israel is sort of in this conflict with Hezbollah is, you know, all the better opportunity for us to now go fight Iran alongside them. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is out there. And it, it, interestingly, the, the Israelis don't seem quite so into it. I mean, there was a there was an article in the Jerusalem Post uh, last week which said that um, the, the U.S. government had been sort of egging the Israeli government on to strike its Syrian targets, and the, the IDF didn't want to do that. So, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it has been interesting to read uh, the New Republic's coverage, um, just because, and it's, it's similar in a way to their Darfur coverage. They did a big cover story, not just a cover story, but a whole issue devoted to Darfur and to the question of whether we need to intervene militarily and coming down on the side that we do. But you searched the issue in, in vain for sort of a realistic assessment of what it would mean to actually commit enough troops to Darfur to make a difference in that struggle. Sure, yeah. And I, I think there's a similar, I mean, it's a problem. It, it's the problem that the Iraq war has created, I think, for the hawkish tendency among opinion journalists, right. which is that, you know, if you're a hawk, you want to use U.S. military force <laughs> in a variety of situations, and you, uh, you and, and yet at this moment we're completely constrained by the occupation of Iraq. Right, well, and also just by the change, you know, I mean, after, after the first Gulf War, or perhaps just the Gulf War, um, and then, <laughs> you know, the airstrikes in Bosnia, and then Kosovo, and then Afghanistan, you know, there have been a whole series of events where... You know, there, there are criticisms that can be made uh, about the, the policies that were followed in, in any of those cases, but where, you know, people who were just skeptical about American force of arms, um, you know, wound up losing the argument. And so then there was a sort of historical moment when, when it was really plausible to just sort of, you know, assume that if we wanted to use force, you know, we right. could. And that the question of whether or not we should was, you know, one about morality or international law right. or so on and so forth. And just, you know, the, the problems in Iraq have created, I think, among more, um, at least among sensible people, just uh, a desire to ask a lot of questions as to, you know, how exactly um, 
things are supposed to work. Uh, you, you know, there's just much, much less confidence that, you know, just because we might like to take some stern action against Syria, that there's actually any, any viable plan there. But, um, you know, a, a lot of um, <clears throat> the more hawkish pundits don't seem to have, uh, you know, caught up with that reality. Yes, or perhaps they're just spending too much time going on APAC-funded junkets to Israel. Right. Well, I, you know, I, I don't yes. know uh, what the uh, <laughs> nature of your trip that, 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 that you're planning on taking was, but... Um, it was entirely, I, I, can, I can say it was entirely innocent, although I was, I was going with a friend who does work um, for, well, he no longer works, but he did work for the Director of National Intelligence, so he had some sure. connection to the military, industrial, Israeli the, complex. The, 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 but it was... Exactly. It was... Well, but, I mean, you know, joking aside, I mean, one thing, you know, I, I, I was interested to learn when I when I started working in the business of Washington, D.C. political punditry was that, um, you know, a, a reasonable number of people in, in our field do, in fact... Um, go over to Israel on trips which are um, paid for and organized by, by APAC. Um, and Jacob Weisberg uh, was on one, in one of those trips right before this broke out, and so naturally came back, um, you know, wrote something about, um, about the situation, uh, you know, because he, he went there to, you know, gain more knowledge about the issues. And then he, um, you know, like a responsible person, uh, you know, said that this had been a, a trip that he'd gone on that was paid for and organized by APAC. Um, Eric Alterman, uh, you know, took a look at that and uh, got, got very critical of um, not so much of, of the column, but just, you know, of the idea that, you know, he, he thought it was inappropriate for, for journalists to be taking trips like that, um, which I think, you know, I mean, it, it raises a, a number of interesting questions. I, I was offered once an opportunity to go on a uh, junket to uh, sunny Bentonville, Arkansas, to learn more about Walmart. Um, you know, I, that, that was not, not so tempting, but, but, but still, I mean, there is a lot of travel kind of funded by interesting, interested parties out there. That's true. I mean, from from my point of view, I'm usually getting getting offers from uh, small South Pacific republics to, but I'm not sure if that's if that's so much to come to their islands uh -huh. so much as to come come by their embassy and have a few free drinks and learn more about the economic opportunities in Micronesia. Sure. But but I've so far managed to avoid it. I mean, I I guess I'm of I'm of two minds about this. On on the one hand, like I I think that any responsible pundit should be able to accept a trip to Israel that's sponsored by APAC without having it, having it taint their views on Israel. And I'm, I'm definitely inclined to believe much more with pundits than with politicians that, um, I guess you'd say, junkets follow views rather than views follow junkets. Right. I mean, with politicians, there's real money involved that really affects their careers. <coughs> so there's much more, if you're accepting money from an organization, you have a much stronger interest to say good things about that organization. Whereas the junket for a journalist, while a nice fringe benefit of being a journalist, is not ultimately something that really affects how your careers go or whether you can pay for your kid's college or something. Right, no. I mean, unless, unless you're Armstrong Williams, you know, and you're taking money from the... From, from whatever department he took money from, I, I don't think Jacob Weisberg's views about Israel were affected or would ever be affected one way or another by APAC's sponsorship of that no, trip. No, I mean, I mean yeah. that seems reasonable to me, and I, I think it, it would be weird for people to be, um, you know, on take, so to speak, in, in that sense. And I, I don't think that's a real issue. But it's more, uh, I, I think, that, um, you know, when, when you have somebody who... I, I, you know, doesn't, like, habitually cover these issues, isn't, um, you know, like, Slate's Middle East guy or foreign right. policy guy. And you go over, you go on a trip, which is, you know, designed to, because it's, it's not a junket. You know, it's, it's designed to provide substantive information to journalists. But obviously, um, I mean, if somebody turned in a story, that was based on, like, a bunch of research they'd done into the question, but all of that research was stuff they found on the APAC website. Right. You would think that, like, right. that, that, that was pretty crappy, you know, and, and, but it seems to me, similarly, you know, you go on, on an APAC trip, and then you come back from that trip, and all of a sudden, you know, you publish your thoughts on, on Israel, and to not just, uh, you know, 
single out Weisberg. Uh, Rich Lowry uh, had a kind of similar, you know, here I am back from my trip thing. And, and again, I, I don't think it's that either of those guys were um, paid off. It's that they were being given, you know, a very kind of limited um, perspective on, on these kind of things. And, and I know that, you know, because these are trips that smart people go on, and because APAC is also run by smart people, they they work to make them not totally propagandistic. And, you know, people do sort of see something of the other side. I think Weisberg said, responding to Alterman, that, you know, they had had them talk to Saeed Barakat, who's a, a Palestinian Authority official. Um, it, you know, and in some ways that makes it better that, you know, people come over there do hear multiple perspectives. But, but on the other hand, I, I, I think it, it almost makes it more uh, more insidious. It would be, if you only talked to, you know, like straight up propaganda, sort of nobody would fall for it. Right. If, yeah, yeah, but but this way, yeah, no, I, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, I, I would, I, the one thing I would say is that from what I've heard, and this is, one of the reasons why I was, uh, one of the many reasons why I wanted to go to Israel, um, having having never been, but um, just that the experience of going to Israel is an experience on a different level, just period, from going to almost any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. And something that many of my friends, Jewish and not, have said to me about going to Israel is, you go there and... It's, you know, it's an intense experience because of, obviously, the history and the religious significance and so on. But it's also an intense experience because it tends, just by its very nature, to build up sympathy for Israelis. Right. Just because you go into a country that is in the Middle East but is clearly a westernized country. Right. And you have a sense, both of the country's westernness and of the fact that it's under siege, just by, just by virtue of traveling through Israel, you feel a sense of solidarity. Right. With, with the Israelis. Right. But, you know, I mean, I, I assume at the same time that if you, like, spent a week, you know, living um, amongst Palestinians, you know, in whatever the living conditions in the West Bank are, and then, you know, came back from that, even if, you know, you spoke for two hours with an Israeli official some, somewhere in the middle of that, that you would come right. back with, with an Israeli official for them. them. Uh, I should say, you know, I, I, I should remind people that if you look at my uh, dialogue with uh, Amy Sullivan from, from two weeks ago, you can see the, the tale of my, my failed efforts to get a fit, uh, free trip to Israel and uh, how this has made me um, bitter and uh, who, who were you trying to get the trip through? I, I, I was trying to take my free birthright Israel trip. Uh, oh, well, that, why? That, well, that what is the problem? To. You are. I am, but no longer. I, I no longer. No, Have they, they've cut off the birthright trip. Was no, no, no. What happened was was that they 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 told me that this trip I was trying to sign up for was full, and I could take a different trip, or I could go next year, or whatever. And I told them I would go next year. Um, and they said, okay, but then, um, you know, a couple months later, I got a call on my cell phone from a guy in a panic who said he was at the airport and he had my tickets and where was I? And, you know, I, I wasn't there because oh. they told me I wasn't on the trip, uh, so I didn't go. Um, so now you've been disinvited from future yes, trips. Yes, I've lost my, my they, they've taken my birthright from me. Oh, wow. Yes. That's quite, that's quite a story. Yes. Although it, and it, it does get at something that, you know, I, I tend to be very pro-Israel in my sympathies, generally. I tend to be a little bit more skeptical than most conservatives of the Israel-U.S. special relationship. But in the apart from U.S. interests in the region, I have sort of, you know, an in, instinctively side with the Israelis. But that said, I do think it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon, the birthright phenomenon. Sure. And the fact that, like, you know, young American Jews are... Are, are, you know, you, you don't want to raise the specter of dual loyalties yeah. because then somebody will track down this dialogue and attack me for suggesting that American Jews have dual loyalties. Right. Sure. But, but there, is, there is clearly an effort on the part of Israel to create a sense of dual loyalties, which is clearly in their interest to right. do. Right, although, I, I, well, I, I, sure. I, I mean, I think the program is actually funded by uh, Canadians. Oh, well, Canadian there goes that Jews. theory. Um, I'm pretty sure, but uh, but yes, I mean, I, I uh, well, it shows it shows what I well, this is why I'm I'm outside, you know, the vast Jewish conspiracy, right. well, so I don't I don't really understand what's going also, on. Also, you know, I mean, we we can see that you're a, you're a, a raging anti-Semite, um, which uh, <laughs> I guess is something you know we we may get to uh, return to later.
Um, well, I, I haven't I haven't had six drinks yet, right, so it's right. sort of. I'll I'll try and drink some more. This this glass is not actually water. It's uh, whatever Mel Gibson was drinking that night. Well, so sure, 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 sure. later in the dialogue, we can. Right, right. Well, look. Summon up okay. the spirit so, of Mel so Gibson. So Jews, you know, we, we've done, but um, how about um, Protestants? President Bush's, you know, core core constituency here, evangelical Christians. Um, and I, I saw there was a there was an interview that his uh, former top speechwriter Michael Gerson uh, did with Christianity Today, um, which was uh, all about this uh, the evangelical community and you know what Gerson thinks about it and, and what the right way to think about politics is. And he he, he sounded to me, you know, basically like a um, like a liberal who. Um, was also pro-life and had some somewhat confused notions about uh, which political party he was in. What was it he said? He, he criticized the attitude that there's a, a set Christian position on any political issue, right? He said something like, you know, people who say there's a Christian position on missile defense. Right, or on, a on Christian missile defense and, and on taxes. On taxes, right, which is, yeah, no, which is a, a statement that departs from... Something. It certainly departs from, say, the Christian coalition right, line, but, and which said, is that you know he not only said that there wasn't a Christian position on missile defense and tax cuts, but that there was a Christian position on assistance to the poor. Yes, that's what I thought made it especially liberal. You know, it wasn't just a sort of cautionary word toward the kind of over partisan, you know, Christian coalition types, but you know, was actually setting up. Uh, an asymmetry where, you know, he was criticizing efforts to mobilize Christianity on behalf of certain elements of conservative politics, but saying that there should be more efforts to, to mobilize Christian sentiment uh, on behalf of, um, you know, what seemed to me like some, some left-wing causes. Well, yeah. No, I, I agree. I was, I was struck by the interview. I mean, I, the one thing I think you shouldn't you shouldn't underestimate, um, and I think people tend to do this, and I tend to do this. Being in Washington, um, there's a tendency to associate sort of ideological conservatism as it appears in Washington mm -hmm. with one Republicans around the country, mm -hmm. and two even sort of conservative, self-described conservatives around the country. And one of the things that I think was very interesting about the Bush administration is that um, there's been a host of conservative critiques recently of Bush's spending, sure. right, his social spending. And people are sort of saying, you know, Richard Vigory is <coughs> criticizing him, Bruce Bartlett's criticizing him, Phyllis Schlafly criticized him, George Will is criticizing him, and talking about, uh, you know, basically saying Bush has deviated from the conservative line on all these things, it's very liberal, and this is why he's in trouble. Mm -hmm. That, you know, okay, he lost liberals over the war, let's say, and over just being a conservative, and he lost moderates over, over the war going badly, but now he's losing conservatives because of his spending. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I, I don't think there's really any evidence for that point of view, because one, Bush, has been, Bush made it very clear from the beginning um, from the first compassionate conservatism talk in the run-up to the 2000 election on through the first few years of his presidency that he was not a small government conservative, right. that he was comfortable with government spending on various things. So, so that was very clear from the beginning. And conservatives, Bush was very popular among self-described conservatives throughout that period. Right. And he was very popular even after No Child Left Behind. He was very popular even when the deficit started to go up. He was very popular even, you know, after the Medicaid or after the prescription drugs, uh, the huge expansion of government in that regard. And the point when conservatives started to sour on him, I think, had to do with Iraq, it had to do with Katrina, and it had to do with immigration. Right. And there's very little evidence that even rank and file conservatives share the sort of movement conservative concerns with spending qua spending. Right. And this is why I think I agree with you that Gerson is clearly someone who in a different era would probably be more comfortable on the more in a more leftward leaning party in a, in a democratic party of the 50s or 60s and that he's probably driven you know primarily into the republican side by concerns over over abortion well, and homosexuality. Well, I mean it was but, just, it's interesting to see that point of view um, from, Express, yeah, well, no, I, from, I mean, from someone who, you know, dedicated, I, I assume he worked very long hours being the chief speechwriter for the President of the United States, you know, it's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, you've gotten used to hearing 
about sort of, you know, regular citizens who may be frustratingly to, to a liberal like myself seems to agree with us about a wide range of things, but for whom uh, Democratic views on abortion are just sort of a deal breaker, so, so they vote Republican. But I mean, just considering the amount of, you know, time, uh, how, how much of his life Michael Gerson, uh, you know, sort of gave over to the political interests of the Republican Party, he seemed, you know, weirdly out of step with sort of the views of the conservative movement and, and also kind of not all that into the Republican Party. As a, as a general matter, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, my, I think his his loyalties were to Bush, to Bush far more personally, far more than to the GOP. And as you said, I think in your blog post about this, you know, Bush's speeches have been. I mean, they were written by Gerson, so you could expect them to be. But they've been Gersonian. I mean, the way Bush talks about poverty and so on, and the way he talks about AIDS in Africa and human rights overseas and so on, um, all all of these things. In, in all of these areas, his rhetoric has been somewhat divorced from the, pri the priorities that he's pursued on the policy side. Right. Yes. And I mean, I, I, I think th this is something that, you know, historians will be, and historians of conservatism will be, and will be arguing about for a long time, but, you know, what actually m m created this disconnect between Bush's rhetoric from the beginning? And it's not so much that he didn't, for instance, pursue education reform or uh, faith-based programs right. or any of these things. It's just that clearly there was a lot of pressure on him to make tax cuts the centerpiece in a first term and, and so forth. Right. Well, I mean, I don't know, though. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean hearing... I, I, the, 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 the Gerson interview made me think that there was maybe a, a, a little less of... You know, I, I, my assumption had always just sort of been to see a lot of this as pure kind of cynicism. You know, people saying, well, we're going to write a speech about X, but then we're going to go do Y. Now, now it almost seems like there might just be, you know, some disagreement among personnel about which elements of the agenda are, are important on some level. Um, yeah, I, I, I am, I mean, based on my limited insider knowledge of, like, the Bush administration sure. <laughs> domestic policy team, I would say the cynicism argument is the wrong one, or at least it's the wrong one for certain people. Right. I mean, I'm 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 personally very curious about the role of the vice president's office, sure, um, in this administration. On dem and I, I think that there, there you do get something closer to the cynicism that you're talking about. But on the other hand, from it's not like Cheney is out there giving compassionate conservative right, speeches. Right. I mean, Cheney's not not pretending; he's just winning political battles inside the administration. Right. Well, it's true. this is something. I mean, we've there's been a lot of reporting now about the operation of, of the vice president's office in the foreign policy process and very little on the on the domestic policy side um, but presumably he's influential there too well he's in, I mean certainly for instance the energy bill you know which is an example of something that I think both you and I would agree was you know not not good legislation sure. <laughs> overall and not not a worthwhile use of government money was a Cheney project right. from the for, beginning for, and reflected sort of straightforward business class Republican priorities. Right, right. Well, all right. Maybe we can blame Dick Cheney for everything. Um, it's possible. I Yes. Wait, what were we going to do now? Uh, well, we, we were going to talk, having talked a little about the Republicans, ah, um, about we the were going to talk about the Democrats. Yes, right. The other party. So, right. I mean, you know, there's this, uh, you know, Joe Lieberman primary thing. and I've heard about right, it, yeah. He's having some trouble, right? Right. But, you know, I mean, this is just part of this kind of, you know, endless for the past two years now, you know, roiling of, of, of the Democratic Party where uh, you have um, bloggers and liberals and so on and so forth uh, taking on what they perceive to be a uh, weak need and, and timid uh, establishment. Um, with Lieberman, you've had this sort of interesting case, uh, instance of a lot of people who do not, like, actually seem to like Joe Lieberman or approve of what he's been doing, Democrats this is, sort of rallying around his side out of, you know, opposition to his opponents, um, you know, which I, I think tends to show just how kind of um, bitter on some ways these, these intra-party divisions are, are getting, that, you know, pe people are taking this sort of enemy, my enemy is my friend attitude toward them rather than, you know, uh, leaving these things on, on a case-by-case -case basis. And I, I was hypothesizing that there's a, at least a, a quasi 
generational um, dynamic at play here, which is that people who were kind of brought into um, the political process relatively recently, which includes most of people on the internet, um, you know, are, are attuned to the dynamic that existed since Clinton's impeachment, since um, the big fight of over recounting votes in Florida, um, since the Iraq War, a, an era of, you know, extreme levels of partisanship, and that, you know, pe people like that, in including myself, um, see this kind of I extreme polarization as, as normal, as a normal feature of, of the landscape. Um, Whereas people who, um, you know, were kind of more, came up in the, in the beginning of the, the Clinton years, have just a lot more optimism about the possibility of compromise and bipartisanship and the virtues of, you know, moderation as a, as a strategy. Well, I mean, I, I, would, I read your theory, and I, it seemed to me incredibly persuasive, um, but I, I then had a couple couple thoughts that made it seem a little less persuasive. Fair enough. And what, one one of them is that the net roots crowd mm -hmm. includes a lot of young people, but it also includes a lot more older people than you would expect right. when they do. And and there's a and, and this is something that you know Marcos Melitzas talks about a lot when he will say, oh, and these people they think we're all 19 year old laptops, but really it's you know, 45-year-olds with laptops and so right. on. Right, well, it, it, it contains a lot of older people, but, I mean, especially when you look at, at, at sort of leading lights people, right? I mean, I mean, Marcos and, and Duncan Black, who, who writes Atrios, are both... Uh, both, that's true. ...significantly older than, 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 than I am, but they are important people in the political world now. And that difficult as it is to believe, yeah, is a, is, a, is a recent phenomenon. That's true. You, you, you know what I mean? Whereas, I, I mean, there are people who are the same age as they are, but who ten years ago were in Washington D.C., right. you know, working in the Clinton administration in some capacity, blah blah blah. Whereas these are people who, you know, ten years ago, it's, it's not that they were nobody; it's that they were doing completely different things. They weren't dedicating their life. To politics, they only came into this very high level of political engagement, you know, recently. Right. Yeah, I mean, the the flip side, the the other possible explanation is that you're right, but it's it's not just about which experiences you had and whether you got radicalized or not, or whether you right. think of it. But but that it it is genuinely that the people who are involved in the net roots are people who are, you know somewhat politically unsophisticated. They're all extremely intelligent, um, mm -hmm. but, but they're people who had never really been engaged in politics before the Internet allowed them to be engaged in politics. And I have to say that there's, there's nobody, I, I think, who's quite so unsophisticated in their politics as a smart, say, 47-year-old who doesn't actually know that much about how politics works. And I, and I do think that this phenomenon plays into the net roots a lot, that you have people saying, well, why can't the Democrats just do this, and then they'll win? What's wrong with these people? Right. I mean, I, now, I, I, I know, I know you're, but, but, but let, me, let me flip around then sure. and say that in, in their defense, I think that they're, I think a lot of the defenses of Lieberman from the Democratic side are kind of, uh, well, well let, let, me, let me put it this way. I'm a, I'm a conservative who thinks the Iraq war, in hindsight, was probably a big mistake, right? Mm -hmm. But now, in my party, my party supported the Iraq War wholeheartedly, and so it doesn't—it simply doesn't make sense as an Iraq War opponent for me to go around trying to, you know, topple senators or purge them just because right. they voted the wrong way on the Iraq War. Because you know that wasn't—you uh, you, know—you wouldn't have a party left. However, right. if you're a Democrat and you think that the Iraq War, as many many Democrats do, was the single biggest foreign policy blunder of the last 20 years or whatever. And Joe Lieberman is the biggest Democratic cheerleader for the Iraq War, and he was, and, and he cheerled for it, and he seems to have been proven wrong. Then it seems a little bit strange to me for other Democrats to say, "Well, but you have to remember that he did this, and he did this, and he did this." I mean, what's the point of having a political system if you can't kick out somebody who gets something hugely, enormously wrong? So well, that's right. what I'm I mean, saying in defense of the net roots, I guess. Sure. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, there, there, there is something to your point about um, 
uh, a certain level of political naivete, I guess, often comes. I, I mean, that's what comes with being an outsider, which is a, a quality that the networks like to claim for themselves right. a lot. But I mean, there and, and there are benefits to to looking at things from the outside. But there are also actual costs to that. I mean, the the operations of. American politics and of Washington D.C. are, you know, somewhat complicated, and you understand them better the the more of an insider you are. And um, I, I think you do see frequently pe- people um, seemingly just not, you know, understanding how how things work. Well, like just um, just to take one but, one one quick example, the the Le- Lieberman and impeachment, for instance, and this is something you hear an awful lot from the networks, right. is that Lieberman betrayed Clinton, betrayed the Democrats, stabbed him in the back, got up and gave a speech attacking him during the Lewinsky st- scandal. When in fact, anyone who was paying any attention at that moment realized that Lieberman did this, I mean, it helped Clinton enormously, and it helped pave the way for the whole censure and move on theory, which gave birth to moveon.org, which gave birth to the Netroots. Right. No, I mean, and that's that's true. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I think, though, sometimes you see, I mean, precisely what you were talking about in the sort of nonsensicalness of the idea that it's illegitimate to want to get rid of Joe Lieberman, you know, because he was wrong uh, 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 on the Iraq war, a kind of in that case, a, a virtue of, of political, it's political true. naivete, that the Netroots, is not just because they were like more left-wing or more anti-war, but precisely because they, in a lot of ways, didn't understand how the Democratic Party works. They didn't know that in the Democratic Party, your views on foreign policy questions just aren't considered that big a deal and that right. nobody is ever supposed to lose their seat over things like that and that what really matters, what's really supposed to matter is whether or not you sort of have the key union guys and right. environmental guys and so on and so forth on board and that you had a bunch of people from the outside who, be- because they didn't know the rules, um, you know, were willing to do something and, and take a stand and, and raise the... Um, you know, I elevate the importance of, of a certain number of issues, which um, I think deserve to be taken seriously, and haven't been in the traditional way uh, the Democratic Party's been uh, been set up. Mar- Mark Schmidt uh, called this the, the end of checklist liberalism. Mm. Um, right. Which and and, and in some ways, I, I think that's good. It it takes people who aren't all that familiar with the system to sort of see the idea that maybe the system should work in a different way. Yeah, that's true. Although I do, I, the the other thing that I've noticed about the Lieberman um, Lamont primary in in the coverage of it is there there's now this weird phenomenon in the pundit class where voters are expected to behave like pundits. Almost, and so you get you get this happens so a lot with really complicated right. second order, second order, third order. You know, the New Republic says, "Well, you shouldn't vote for Lieberman because of this, but you should vote for him because it'll send a message to this." And 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 what what interests me is that, I mean, I, I made the point a minute ago about you know, the, the virtues of saying, "Well, why shouldn't we just vote him out for uh, being against the right. Iraq War?" But what's and what's interesting is that in at least in the last Democratic primary season. Primary voters actually behaved like that. They behaved like sort of pundits thinking about second-order effects. And John Kerry <laughs> wouldn't have been nominated if a lot of Democratic voters hadn't sort of done this weird political calculus in their head about electability and all of these things. Um, yes, and I, people, and I'm not pe- sure if people almost know too much. Well, I, I'm not sure if is this a new thing in American politics. I mean, I, I suspect it is, but I'm not... You know. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of situation where a- actual knowledge would, would be would helpful. be helpful. Yeah, it, it seems new though. It does it does seem new, and it does. I mean, in a way, it could be it could be a good thing because it it goes even further towards weeding out extremists, just because people won't vote for extremists, not only because they seem extreme, but because they're worried about electability. But on the other right. hand, sometimes sometimes you can use an extremist like you know in in retrospect would it have been that much worse for the democrats to nominate howard dean than john Kerry? i'm not sure sure i mean you know i think pundits tend to do their worst work our worst work when we try to be political strategists mm-hmm. rather than journalists yeah. and, and writers and and i think voters i think get get even worse <laughs> when they do it that way i mean it's, right. it's genuine it's genuinely hard to know 
who's going to win elections and what things are going to be popular, you know, 47 months from now right. and, and, and so on and so forth. And um, you, you tend to think that, you know, probably I am not best using my time thinking about that and that, you know, probably average voters are not that uh, good at making these kind of assessments because running campaigns is sort of about trying to manipulate Right. The electorate. And the electorate, of course, as a rule, doesn't think it can be manipulated or may have very silly ideas about what other people will, will find persuasive. Like the um, fact that John Kerry served in Vietnam. and yeah, Right. Exactly. It was like nobody was actually persuaded by that. But everyone kind of thought that, that someone, someone else, else would might be, be right. dumb enough. Yep. To be persuaded by that, when if everyone had just gone with their gut instinct, like, do I find that argument persuasive? They would have said no, right, and come to a you know better aggregate conclusion. Um, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out then next time around. I mean, I think this is also more for now more a Democratic than a Republican phenomenon. But I just because Democrats are. Are, are out of the majority, so there's more sense of, like, how do we calculate this best to, right. to win? Because clearly, if Republicans had been highly calculating in 2000, they would have nominated John McCain, and we would be in, we would be in a, whole different, a whole different universe, sure. much like, let's say, the universe that Mel Gibson inhabits. Yes, where the Jews start all where the wars. Where the Jews start all the wars. Um, that, that's John McCain's universe too. That I, I hope not, but I guess I guess oh, I guess okay, we, sure. I guess we'll find out. No, uh, I guess I, all, all I was saying was that there are different alternate universes. In one alternate universe, John McCain is president. In another one, uh, the Jews do in fact start all the wars, and Mel Gibson right. isn't isn't just. But but I so oh, I'm sorry, Matt. I, are you still there? Yeah. I just dropped my uh, dropped my headset. It's been slipping out of my oh. ear. Probably all the. You know, humidity in Washington or something. Well, no, the Jews. The Jews probably, probably did. did it. So what? Because uh, they're they're trying to silence. So what? What um, do you think about the fire? I mean, I I, I I noticed that you're one of the one of the very few people, um, who not a conservative Christian, who who agrees with me that the Passion is actually a pretty good movie, in spite of having some anti-Semitic overtones. Yes, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm glad that by um, kind of ranting and raving, Mel Gibson has allowed us to, I think, get past the debate over whether or not the passion has some anti-Semitic overtones, which I think it pretty clearly does. At the same time, you know, while obviously I understand why nobody wants to be like anti-Semitism is fine, you know, because because it's not. Um, there are actually plenty of works that have some anti-Semitic uh, themes or, or elements to them that, that people don't um, object to as, as a rule. I mean, I, I think I, I cited the, the Great Gatsby as an example. Um, it's not quite the same because it's more incidental there. But, you know, some of T.S. Eliot's work, some oh, of yeah, accounts, so, some of that's just Dostoevsky's. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, it's bad, and I'm not saying people should, like, embrace that. Um, they shouldn't. But, you know, at the, at the same time, a, a work can be good without you endorsing every one of its sentiments. I mean, you know, I, I don't think Jesus Christ died for my sins. but I, Oh, I don't you're so wrong, me. man. <laughs> sure. But, I mean, I, 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 I don't think that fact prevented me from uh, appreciating some of what um, that they were trying to do and the passion. I mean, tell a story about Jesus Christ dying for my sins and, and suffering for them. Um, you know, so yeah, I'm, I think you can, you can appreciate things without endorsing them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Gibson was also in... I mean, it's, it's obviously his, his own fault that there are anti-Semitic overtones in the Passion, but he was, he was in, a, in a somewhat difficult position, um, one, just based on the fact that, you know, the, the crucifixion story is a story about the Son of God being rejected by, among others, Jewish religious leaders. And, and sure. two, by the fact that yeah, there, there is a phenomenon, I think, with motion pictures in particular, um, where there's, when you have a villain, there's a tendency for the villain to be ethnically defined. And so, you know, if you watch any movie in which the villain is British, the villain will not only be British, he will be the stereotype of British, yes. and uh, and clearly, if you're dealing with a movie where some of you, some of your villains are Jews, you need to think much more carefully about this issue. And I think that the portrayals of the chief priests, which I think is the main the main place where you can find right. anti-Semitism in in the Passion, do they betray the same? I mean, basically, it's the same thing 
Gibson did in Braveheart, where the English are just... I mean, if you, if you, want, to, if you want to see anti-English bigotry, go watch Braveheart. Well, this is actually what I thought was the, 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 the under-discussed thing about the Mel Gibson oeuvre, is the um, virulent anti-British... Right, in the Patriot, that, too, that, yeah. That, that, that are in the Patriot and Braveheart, and, I mean, you know, he, he, he was not the director, but I, I think, um, um, in, uh, uh, he, he's in Gallipoli. Right? right, that's, yes, and he plays an Australian in Gallipoli, and, of course, in Gallipoli the Australians were, you know, sent to certain doom by foolish British commanders. By, by the right. British, and you know, I mean, and I thought that you know, in in, in Gallipoli, uh, the, the 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 anti-British themes were, were reasonable and were were, were handled okay, um, since that stuff really happened. Um, but you know, I mean, a, a Braveheart, which I, I know so, some people like a great deal. I, I um, actually like it a great deal, but see, I, I felt that in, in this desire to sort of get get get, get in the English bashing and, and so on and so forth, we went with this very bizarre movie with a totally anachronistic. Um, right. You know, idea about Scottish nationalism and, um, yeah, y- you know, a, a, a potentially interesting uh, medieval story was like uh, although to be to sort be, of racked on the shoals of Gibson's hang-ups with the English, and, and nobody even hates the English. Well, that's true, but that is why you can get away with. I mean, it's why the English make such perfect villains, and and I suppose I would, you know, not to be not to associate myself too much with with the cult of PC, but there is something, there is good reason for using the English as convenient villains and trying to avoid using, say, the Jews as convenient villains, precisely because, as you say, nobody hates the English. So there's no danger that Braveheart is going to stir up, you know, that they're going to show it. I mean, this, this is the argument that Andrew Sullivan has been harping on for the last three days, which is that, you know, the passion has anti-Semitic overtones, and Gibson allowed it, what, what Gibson really did that was so terrible was he allowed it to be released in the Middle East, you know, at a time of maximum Jew-hating. Sure. Although, you know, I mean, I don't know. You know, I, this is normally, you know, um, when when I'm sort of defending movies from conservative attacks. Um, but I feel the same way this way. That there's a tendency to, like, overrate oh. the causal efficacy of movie making. Well, I, com- um, I completely agree. And actually, I think Sullivan linked, maybe somebody else did, but linked to a, a piece of anti-Semitic uh, filmmaking from, I think, Saudi Arabia, not maybe Kuwait, where... And, and, and I watched that, and, uh, you know... Think, with things like that being shown in the Middle East, and basically in mm-hmm. this in this video, you know, a couple Christians are getting crucified by the Romans, um, and a party of Jews just sort of wanders by, comes up and starts stoning the Christians while they're being crucified, and the Romans say, "Oh, don't! They're going to die anyway." And then the Jews bribe the Romans to go away and continue stoning them. And I mean, now, yes. you know, say what you will about the passion. I mean, there's anti-Semitism, and then there's real anti-Semitism. And with things sure, like this I mean, being shown in the is... Middle East, I hardly think, and there really, there's no, you know, no, nobody's leaving the passion and going out and signing up for Hezbollah. They're signing up for Hezbollah anyway. And then they're going to the screenings of the passion. Well, right, yeah, so. Hezbollah organized. No, no, right. I mean, I, uh, I agree. I mean, it's not a, you know, I mean, what, what I will say, insofar as I, am a, a little inclined to make a, a political axe-grinding point about the passion. It, it's simply that um, there are a lot of people, you know, on the right, in the conservative movement, who, when it comes to a political discussion that's taking place where there are liberals criticizing U.S. foreign policy or Israeli foreign policy, are ready to scream anti-Semitism at the drop of a hat. That like, if you use the word neoconservative in a somewhat overbroad manner, right. you know that shows you're an anti-Semite. That if you if you criticize something Israel does in a somewhat intemperate way, it shows you hate all the Jews everywhere. But that then, when the passion initially came out, and there was lots of reason to think because of you know Gibson's membership and kind of you know weird Schismatic, kind of splinter right. group, as, as well as you know the content of the film, even before this drunken outburst, I mean it was pretty clear what was going on. But the inclination of the conservative mainstream was to bend over backwards um, to defend Gibson. And, um, you know, as a, 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 an actual Jewish person, that, that to me was a kind of clarifying moment that the sort of new American rights level of hyper-concern with anti-Semitism has very little to do with an actual 
super heightened sensitivity about Jews and a lot to do with just trying to find, you know, bludgeons to badger your, your political enemies with. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I see your point. I, on, on the other hand, I mean, I do think, I, I think the passion is actually just a fascinating test case overall of the extent to which some ideology has just overwhelmed, uh, I mean, uh, over, overwhelmed criticism almost in, in America today. Sure. And I, I mean, just, and what, what you saw on the right, I completely agree and I, I, about the, the, the extent to which they bent over backwards, particularly because Gibson's comments about the Holocaust when, when this film was being released were, were just weird. Like, they were the comments of someone who clearly had, at the very least, unresolved issues about, about right. these I mean, questions. Was, uh, right. But that said, I think that the, the reaction to the movie from a host of critics who are not, you know, quote-unquote liberal critics, but they are critics who are liberals and have certain ideas sure. about, you know, ideas about what, who Jesus was and what kind of portrayals of Jesus should be made and were, were also reflected of a very... Just, just a very strange politicization, and maybe that was inevitable. But it's also weird because Gibbs is not particularly conservative. I think in his own politics, I think that he, his, he's, he's sort of a, you know, he, he seems very anti-Bush, and he's talked about like in, sure. the in, coming environmental catastrophe. I mean, I, I think having known some yeah. weird schismatic, well, and somewhat embarrassingly, you know, from, from my point of view, but you know, as an anti-Semite. Gibson seems to have come to be very critical of Bush's foreign policy endeavors. Um, <laughs> well, see, it is all connected after all. I mean, mainly I, I feel sorry right. for him because he is, he is an alcoholic. He's probably got some kind of bipolar disorder. And he had a father who was a, a, you know, a true lunatic anti-Semite. And I think that there should, there should definitely be a moment's pity for anyone who, who had a father who was a lunatic anti-Semite. Sure. I, you know, I, I always find it hard to sympathize with incredibly wealthy people. This is, this is a fair point, yes. This is the, the, the resentments that make me want to tax them. Well, no, no, I, 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 I take your point. It's true. But he, ha- but he has no, had sure. seven kids, so I'm on board as a pronatalist. Oh, so, okay. you know, I can't, I can't get, get too mad at him. But and they'll just spread the genes further. Well, if, if you think anti-Semitism is in the genes, but, I mean, there's, right. you know... I, I guess that's not very plausible. Well, it seems it seems it so seems, it seems a little it seems point. a little dangerous from the point of view of someone who's against anti-Semitism to start accusing other people right. of having things in the genes. But I suppose it's possible. Okay, it makes sense. Well, see, obviously, um, I started saying uh, crazy, so crazy time things. To wind I'm not it prepared up. to yep. defend, <laughs> and it's it's time to stop. Well, it's been a pleasure, Matt, and uh, go out it, and enjoy the heat. Excellent. It always is. Talk right. to you soon. Bye. Bye.